Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us at Johns Hopkins uh, University SAIS Rethinking Iran Initiative. I'm Nargis Bajobli, an assistant professor here at Hopkins SAIS. Along with my colleague, Professor Vadi Nass, we'd like to welcome you to today's very timely event. Given Iran's growing strategic relationship with Russia vis-a-vis -vis the West, especially under the um, Trump's maximum pressure imposed sanctions, the past month's war between Russia and Ukraine has caused some serious reverberations within the socio-political terrain in Tehran, especially given Russia's long history with, uh, in, in Iranian affairs. There's no one better to help us uh, understand and contextualize what's going on today uh, within the, the history of the century's long relationship between Russia and Iran than preeminent historian of Iran, Professor Abbas Amanat. For those of you who study Iran, um, you know the work of Professor Abbas Amanat because his scholarship has been in, indispensable and he's been a teacher for all of us. He really doesn't need much introduction at all. Professor Amonats is a professor emeritus of history at Yale University, where he taught um, from 1983 until 2021. And he served as the director of the program in Iranian studies at the Macmillan Center. He's written about early modern and modern history of Iran, the Middle East, the Muslim world, and the Persian world. His magnum opus, Iran, A Modern History, which was published by Yale University Press in 2017, is, as I was telling him before we went live, a critical text that I teach with often in all of my classes of Iran, and I know many of my colleagues do as well. It's uh, become a very critical text in understanding the broader history of the social, uh, cultural, and political um, um, history of modern Iran. My Colleague Professor Vadi Nas will moderate the conversation with Professor Amanat. Before I turn the floor over to them, I'd just like to remind the audience that you can please ask your questions in the chat function on YouTube and we'll monitor them and pose those questions to our speaker uh, during the latter half of the hour. So without further ado, Vadi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nargis. And, and let me also welcome Professor Amanat to SPICE. It's really wonderful having you here. And much like Nargis, I've greatly benefited from your work all the way back to my uh, uh, graduate student days. Uh, so it's, it's, it's doubly great pleasure to have you here. Um, you know, in the past uh, um, month, the issue of Iran-Russia relations has become a much bigger subject uh, of, of interest and particularly of debate within Iran, uh, not only the war in Ukraine and, and Russia's desire to expand its uh, borders, uh, but also the, the role that the Russia played uh, for a period of time in holding the nuclear deal hostage in terms of getting concessions from the West that raised issues about, uh, you know, the value of this relationship for Iran uh, within Iran itself, whether or not the Russians are well-meaning and brought out, I, I guess, a certain degree of uh, uh, historical memory in Iran, uh, sort of uh, it, it, it picked on historical wounds that, uh, uh, that, that uh, were very interesting to watch. And, and, and I think you know, it, it's impossible to understand uh, how Iranians think about Russia or how they should assess it without looking at the long history of this relationship. So I wanted to start by asking you, uh, you, know, if you if you can cast uh, this, this picture widely, uh, you know, what is the length and breadth of this relationship? Wh uh, when did it start? How did it start? And, and how has this sort of uh, flown through history? Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for the occasion. Let me start first by thanking uh, Nagis and of course Vadi uh, for a generous introduction and for the chance uh, to talk to your audience uh, today. Uh, maybe the tone of what I'm going to share with you is somewhat different from your uh, uh, your conventional uh, 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 presentations on rethinking Iran, which I presume is the name of the series, um, and by being a little bit more historical. So I hope I'm not going to disappoint anybody that I'm not going to focus on contemporary issues, although it's very much in my mind, as it is in the mind of everybody who today is witnessing what's happening around us. Um, well, when I proposed uh, Russia and Iran, 300 years of contention and compliance uh, and setting the date from 1722. Of course, I had in mind today is the tricentennial. This year is the tricentennial, as a matter of fact. I had in mind really what is usually been defined as the modern era or 
early modern and modern era, starting from the fall of the Safavids onward in 1722. It's remarkable to see that with the fall of the Safavids in that date, uh, Iran, uh, large chunks of it, uh, was uh, invaded and occupied by the neighboring powers, by the Ottomans in the West, who basically uh, took over uh, from all the way from Kurdistan to Khuzestan, all of the Western Iran, and with uh, Russia of the Peter the Great uh, that uh, invaded through the Caucasus coming down into the Northern provinces of the Caspian, in southern provinces of the Caspian and northern Iran, first Gilan, then Mazandaran, then Azerbaijan for a period of 10 years. This is really what we often define as the starting point for a very eventful period that basically continues all the way up to the conclusion of the Treaty of Turkmenistan, the infamous Treaty of Turkmenistan in 1829 and uh, uh, probably it covers a period of uh, Iran for the first time uh, you know, witnessing the rise of a Christian power in its northern uh, uh, frontiers. One should bear in mind that throughout the Safavid period from the 16th century, uh, Iran being a two-front uh, empire, uh, Safavid Iran, uh, witnessed most of the time experience the two uh, aggressive powers in its western and eastern fronts, western being the Ottoman Empire, at the time probably the greatest in military power of its own time, up to probably 17th century, late 17th century, early 18th century, and on its east uh, with the Uzbeks and other semi-tribal uh, populations that constantly uh, caused trouble for the uh, for the Safavids as soon as there would have been any weakness. Now, what happens in the course of this period from the uh, start of the 18th century onwards, and certainly by the very end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century, is that there is a shift that now we witness that Iran encountering two European powers, the, Russia, the Russians in the north and the uh, British in the uh, south, in uh, British India, colonial India, and in the Persian Gulf. And uh, this was a uh, very remarkable shift in terms of uh, geopolitical uh, uh, significance. And what we would witness that indeed Russia becomes, in my opinion, the greatest geopolitical challenge that Iran witnesses um, throughout the period from the late 18th century, perhaps to the collapse of the Soviet Union, but uh, with what is now witnessing today, probably out to today. So uh, if you compare that to the other powers, great powers uh, of the 19th century and 20th century, uh, probably the British impact or British uh, challenge to Iran was far less um, than, than Russia and, of course, later on, the United States. Why this is important? Because we see that Iran not only uh, uh, witnesses the loss of territory uh, throughout the course of the uh, late 18th century and early 19th century, the first quarter of the 19th century, uh, but uh, after that, both in the Caucasus and in Central Asia, uh, but also uh, afterwards uh, a period of uh, diplomatic pressure and uh, commercial concessions uh, that uh, from more or less, uh, we witnessed from 1829 all the way up to the 1906, the Constitutional Revolution. And also, it's a, quite a challenge for Iran because uh, almost from the start, uh, there has been a certain proxies or one might call sympathizers that uh, acted more or less on behalf of the Russian interest. First, uh, the Armenians and the Georgians that uh, paid their homage and loyalty to the Ottomans, uh, to the Russians in the North 
Afterwards, um, by the beginning of the Bolshevik Revolution, we see that there are ideological reorientation of some of the revolutionary forces towards Russia that continues all the way into the 20th century with the two-day party. Uh, prior to that, with the Democratic uh, Party of Azerbaijan, uh, uh, that uh, during the 1945-46 uh, secedes or attempts to secede from Iran. So in a sense, that was another important challenge that there was always a certain sympathy or proxy within, within Iran. And finally, one we should bear in mind that although uh, the, the Russian empire uh, posed as a great threat or a menace to Iran in its northern frontiers uh, throughout this period, it was also a conduit, uh, it was a conduit for uh, the earliest uh, Iranian um, uh, encounter, uh, encounters with aspects of modernity uh, through the Caucasus that comes under Russian control, uh, but maintains its relations with Iran throughout the 19th century. Uh, communities of um, emigres who uh, move from Iran to the Caucasus, the most famous, well-known of them, being the workers in the Baku oil fields in the early part of the 20th century um, that also uh, served as an important connection between Iran and particularly in transmitting certain revolutionary ideas and the connection between uh, Southern Caucasus and Tabriz during the Constitutional Revolution. These also are aspects that one should bear in mind a great significance in the way that Iran was transformed in the course of the 19th century and the early 20th century, ideologically, but also culturally and economically by the end of the 19th century. To myself. Uh, so, you know, given this long history, which um, as, as, as you posited, during which uh, Russia emerged as, a, as the most significant geostrategic threat. And perhaps no other uh, power uh, uh, has taken away more territory uh, from Iran than Russia, uh, if I may say, has not imposed as humiliating a defeat uh, on Iran as, as has Russia. And, and in a sense that, you know, the Treaty of Turkmenistan which Iran signed with Russia has become a, a, a sort of a, a, a phrase within Iranian lexicon to define humiliation, even most recently used by none other than Secretary Pompeo to, to refer to Iran-China relations. And, and also that the, 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 aside from the Iran-Iraq war, uh, the, uh, the only other time which Iranian territory looked to be ceded from the country was less than 80 years ago in 1946. Yes. And yet uh, it looks like uh, Russia uh, uh, in, in, current, in contemporary Iranian political consciousness has not uh, occupied uh, the kind of view of menace or threat that uh, you know, focuses the mind the way Britain and, and, and the United States has done. I mean, it, it's always been an enigma to me that uh, the events of 1953 in Iran happened only seven years after Iran nearly lost two, two large provinces to, yeah. to Russia. And yet that event has become the rallying cry for, for Iranian nationalism or that the United States could be viewed as an existential threat to Iran. Uh, so, so I'm just a bit uh, sort of at the loss about how have Iranians internalized this 300 year history in a way that the Russians have actually come up as less of a threat in their contemporary imagination than, than, than the Western world. I think this is a great question and rather a difficult one to find a specific answer, but I do my best. For one thing, since 1953, uh, it seems that although Iran was an arena of a, uh, uh, of, a of a of cold of the Cold War between uh, between the West and the uh, Soviet Union, 
the impact of which upon Iran was relatively limited. That is that everyday Iranians did not witness that kind of an aggression that the earlier generations witnessed during the constitutional revolution and the, during the 19th century. And memories often being short, uh, that uh, sense of a, uh, urgency uh, uh, was less visible or less tangible to the Iranians uh, in the uh, latter part of the 20th century than it would have been earlier on, because they really, after the crisis of Azerbaijan in 46, uh, 45, 46, Iranians never really witnessed, except for the two the party, that it's a different issue that we can deal with later on. But why the British, in a sense, were, were targeted as the chief menace to Iran and it, its uh, domestic and international um, uh, position uh, is, is a very difficult one. I think it goes back to the oil crisis in the uh, 1940s and 50s that the Anglo-Iranian oil company uh, 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 appeared as the great uh, uh, threat to the Iranian sovereignty, economic sovereignty, one might say. And uh, uh, Iranian nationalism developed this kind of a narrative, if you like, uh, to consider the British as being this uh, kind of a uh, rather uh, uh, conspiratorial force uh, that tend to interfere into the domestic affairs of Iran and in particularly because much of the intellectuals, much of the educated middle classes in the course of the 1940s and 50s gradually either were recruited to the to the party or became sympathizers of the to the party, the image of the Soviet Union gradually changed. Uh, this image of Russia gradually changed as it was the case all around the world. I mean, Iran was not an exception. And although the threat was there, this kind of a sense of fascination with what's defined as this socialist paradise was also there. And that also uh, impacted the way that the Iranians viewed the Soviet Union in, in its latter stage after uh, 44, after 45, 46. Ma now, what you've just said also earlier on about the uh, uh, the uh, two rounds of wars that Iran fought with Russia, uh, that is between 1904 or 1904, I'm sorry, 1804, 1805, and 1813, the first round of the wars that resulted in the treaty, the famous Treaty of Golestan, and then the second round fought between uh, in a much shorter period in 1826, 1828, that resulted again in the Iranian defeat and loss of further territories in the Caucasus and Aras River as being the frontier between, uh, uh, between um, Russia and Iran that remains up to today, uh, leading into the Turkmenistan Treaty. Yes, this plays a very important part in the Iranian psyche and historical memory, uh, perhaps somewhat unfairly, if I may say. Iranians tend to blame, of course, the Qajars. This game of Qajar bashing is, a, is the one that has developed ever since the rise of the Pahlavi dynasty in the 1920s and continued up to the present, even in the uh, textbooks of the Islamic Republic you would find the same phenomenon, totally an unrealistic perspective about the abilities of Iran and uh, ignoring uh, the enormous uh, military and uh, 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 demographic resources of uh, Russia. And uh, uh, often one uh, hears from many of the nationalist narratives of uh, today, Iranian national narratives, that yes, it was all the failure of 
the rulers of the time, Fat Ali Shah, that uh, was uh, incapable, they were incompetent to try to organize Iranian forces, armed forces to fight against uh, Russia and preserve uh, the provinces uh, of the Caucasus for Iran. But there are certain things that tend to, people tend to forget. For one thing, Russia has been an expansionist power and rather an aggressive expansionist all through the early modern times and modern times, not to mention the medieval period. And uh, the shift from the Duchy of the Moscovy to the Russian Empire uh, always had its, almost in its DNA, a sense of an expansion. Uh, this was the second nature of the Ottoman, of the, um, of the uh, Russian expansion uh, that is part of its political culture. Uh, and with an uh, interest towards the South because of its wealth of the uh, Caucasus, uh, because of the possibility of trade, uh, access to a warmer climates, one might say. And this was always a source of attraction uh, for, for the Russians in, in the North. One should bear in mind that the resources that the, that the Russians had was far greater than uh, Iran or Ottoman Empire or any other power in the East, uh, one might say, uh, would have been able to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to put uh, together. Um, for instance, if you look at the population of, uh, just in terms of giving you some figures, uh, the population of uh, Iran, at the turn of the 19th century was barely 5 million, 4 to 5 million. And Iran was coming out of a devastating civil war that uh, was fought for a very long period of time with some, uh, with some uh, periods of stability in between. Uh, but ever since the fall of the Safavid Empire to the rise of the Rajars, in the beginning of the 19th, late 18th century, Iran uh, was basically tremendously weakened. Demographically was depopulated. Its resources were lost in terms of economic resources. The, if you look at the Russian empire in comparison, the population at around 1800 was something uh, close to six, 36 million. Uh, by 1860s, it was 75 million. By 1890s, it was 125 million. And by 1913, it was 170 million. Compared to Iran, that probably from 5 million, only the population grew to nearly 10 million by the time of the Constitutional Revolution, the end of the Constitutional Revolution, and probably 12 or 13 million. Uh, by the time of the rise of the Pahlavi dynasty. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the the uh, Russian army was probably the strongest army in uh, at the turn of the 19th century. Um, one should only bear in mind that Iran was defeated in the war um, in, 19, in 1813, uh, only shortly after, probably a few months after, uh, the Russian Empire has managed to destroy uh, the uh, uh, French Napoleonic uh, invasion of uh, Russia, which probably involved close to a, something close to 300,000 uh, 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 soldiers. So uh, it's not every day that you can find an empire who can fight and defeat uh, the Napoleonic army and then at the same time uh, defeat almost at the same time the uh, Iranian forces in the south. And if you look at the wars of 19, 1826 to 28, you would see that the Russians again defeated Iran in 1828 uh, and defeated the Ottomans a year later, 1829. And uh, both of them uh, very decisive victories uh, for for Russians. Uh, 
th therefore, it is impossible to uh, blame really uh, the uh, existing uh, power in Iran, that's the Qajar Iran, uh, for its failure not to be able to uh, win the war against Russia. Uh, also, one should bear in mind that uh, many, if not all, of the provinces of the Caucasus, usually referred to as 17 provinces, um, which today constitutes uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan, Republic of Armenia, and Republic of Georgia, and perhaps part of Dagestan further in the north. Uh, these had all, almost, one might say, a nominal loyalty to the Rajar uh, government. Even earlier on, during the reign of Nader Shah, uh, you would see that there is a great degree of disloyalty towards the center, towards the, the Iranian center, as opposed to uh, certain sympathies for Russia among the Christian population of, of the Caucasus. So in a sense, uh, the claim that these were Iranian provinces per se, they were vassals, of course, of, of Iran, uh, and nominally they were part of Iran. Uh, uh, but in reality, if you focus on the details of the period, you would see that there wasn't much of a real loyalty on the side of these powers. Even among the Qajars who were settled in the Caucasus, there wasn't as much of a loyalty towards Tehran as uh, it was for certain, in a sense, if you like, uh, 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 their own, uh, um, one might say, independence or, or autonomy of some sort uh, that they were seeking. Uh, for the Armenians population, for the Georgian population, it was a clear shift uh, toward Russia under Catherine II, you would say at the very end of the 18th century, that becomes very evident. So in a sense, the, uh, just to sum up, the image that uh, most of the nationalist narrative, Iranian nationalist narrative presents of the loss of territories to Iran is very, very questionable. Not to mention the way that these territories in the first place in the course of the 16th century has been annexed to the Safavid Empire. That by itself, as I've explained in my, in my book, Iran and Modern History, is a very, very questionable episode. So, so in a way, uh, uh, we can say despite, despite sort of the 300 year, year history that has been uh, contentious between Iran and, and, and the Russian empire, largely, uh, uh, the, the loss of these territories have not constituted a major, um, a major sort of strategic uh, landmark for Iran. It hasn't, it hasn't left that kind of an imprint. Well, it did and it didn't. It, it created a certain fear of further Russian expansion towards northern Iran. I mean, one should be aware of the fact that after 1828, uh, Russia really did not attempt to gain any further territory in northern Iran. And it, this can be attributed to various factors. One can argue that probably it was not what might call cost efficient for Russian empire to move southward beyond uh, the Caucasus into the Iranian interior. Uh, maybe this is the case, although I'm not fully convinced of that because Russia has actually expanded and uh, occupied and uh, annexed territories which were far less cost efficient than Iran proper would have been. So in Central Asia, for instance, in the, in the exteriors of the Siberia, these are lands that uh, compared to Iran were far less uh, beneficial for an empire to annex. So what I would say, that Iranians by and large in the course of the 19th century, and one might say even in the 20th century, were careful to, once they learned their lessons, that through military uh, engagement, 
they would not be able to preserve their territorial integrity and their sovereignty. The only way that they had to deal with these great powers, both in the South, both in the North and in the South, was through negotiation. Accommodation, compliance, giving and giving something and preserving something. Giving in a sense, if you like, something in the periphery and preserving something in the center. And that very, very clearly uh, 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 evident in the process uh, uh, from the second quarter of the 19th century all the way to the Constitutional Revolution. Under Muhammad Shah, under, certainly under Nasir Din Shah, we see that there are certain tools uh, that he would engage in order to be able to deal with the Russian threat and use actually that in a certain balance of power between the North and the South. So you can see in much of the correspondence, uh, British correspondence, I haven't read the Russian correspondence, but the British uh, diplomatic correspondence in the 19th century would see that uh, British representatives uh, uh, constantly uh, make the point that Nasir Din Shah and his ministers um, uh, point out that, look, you have to give us some room in order to be able to resist against Russian expansion from the North. So the fear of the expansion is always, whether true or imaginary, it's always there and used as a kind of a tool in order to harness the British uh, accesses. So, uh, or giving concessions, that's another thing. Uh, you would see that in the course of the 19th century, Iranians after Turkmen Chai provided numerous concessions to the uh, Russians in the North, fishery in the Caspian Sea, uh, uh, some uh, concessions for road making, uh, for strategic uh, locations that came under the Russian control. But if you look, actually, that's quite interesting and some kind of a credit to the uh, to the Nasseri period, that the number of concessions that were given to the Russians were far less in terms of their value compared to the concessions that were given to the British. For instance, the, um, the uh, 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 Imperial Bank of Persia, uh, that was a British concession, the opening of the Karun in the South, which was a British concession, Reuters, which of course was failed, largely because of the fact that Nasir Din Shah became very aware of the fact that he should maintain the balance between the two powers. Regi later on, uh, although it failed largely because the Russians were pressuring Iran in order to prevent a greater uh, penetration of the uh, British economic uh, 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 presence in Iran. Uh, so in that regard, uh, we should, we should be, in a sense, uh, very um, appreciative of the fact that although the Qajars were a weak regime, it was a buffer state between the two powers, but nevertheless, they managed to preserve Iran's uh, territorial uh, integrity and preserve Iran's sovereignty. And partly through the politics of prestige, as I would call it. I mean, if you look at Nasser Din Shah's travels to Europe, the uh, tours to Europe, uh, it's very obvious that he basically, the main purpose of this trip, contrary to what is usually been said, that has been to, try to introduce him to the uh, great progress of Western powers, industrialization, etc. But the main reason for it is to try to establish Iran as a sovereign state that could be honored and recognized by the European powers, including the, the Russians. If you read the accounts of the Russian reception of Nasser Din in the 19th century, this becomes very evident. He has been received as a royal, he has been received as a, as a, as a, um, a sovereign with a long history of Iran uh, that has been appreciated both in Russia and elsewhere. Um, uh, and therefore he plays this game 
of prestige in order to be able to maintain at the time, one should bear in mind at the time when much of the world by the late 19th century, early 20th century were colonized in one way or another, either by Russians or by the British or for that matter by the French. So in a sense, it's a kind of a miracle that Iran manages to maintain its, uh, its uh, sovereignty throughout the course of the late uh, 19th century. Also, one should bear in mind, that's the, another point, which is quite significant. Russian expansion at the time when it's encountering Iran at the late 18th century and early 19th century was far greater in Eastern Europe as you might know, the annexation of the Crimea in 1774, which was a model, the famous Treaty of Kuchuk Kanaji, uh, was a model for all this capitulatory uh, model of um, uh, relations, such as Turkmen Chai with Iran. Uh, it uh, took over the uh, um, entire um, uh, uh, Eastern European. Uh, neighboring powers, neighboring uh, regions, uh, partitioned Poland um, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, other uh, small nations of the Baltics, all of them came into the uh, annex as part of the Russian empire. So in a sense, it's remarkable to see that Iran manages to maintain certain um, uh, uh, sovereignty of its own in, in, in such circumstances. Yes, yeah, so there's no doubt that it's, uh, it's it's always been an enigma how Iran actually survived the the, the 19th century intact. Uh, and I have to say, I had not thought of Nasreddin Shah's um, uh, travels to Europe, uh, which are often sometimes uh, also subject of parody, as yes. having had 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 the opposite value of actually shoring up Iran's uh, uh, status. Now, it, um, I'm wondering also um, you, uh, whether um, uh, Iranian leaders also opportunistically uh, use Russia very effectively in a case of, uh, you know, for both balancing the West as well as serving their own internal uh, internal um, needs. I mean, uh, one can think of Muhammad Ali Shah using mm -hmm. uh, Russian soldiers to try to suppress um, the uh, the constitutional forces uh, uh, in in 19. In that period, 1905 to 11, and then uh, also today, the, the revolutionary guards in Iran, with its very close use of um, an alliance with Russia for a variety of both military as well as political sets of issues. So, so I, I just want wondering whether historically, how how do you see that? That when Iran is actually the one uh, is the tail that's wagging the dog rather than the other way around. Well, yes, it is. It can be said. Uh, uh, that it tried to take advantage of moments of crisis in its encounters with uh, Russian Empire. For instance, during the Crimean War in 1853 to 1855, um, once um, Russia was in a defensive position versus the European powers, the French and the British, uh, Iranians, uh, uh, immediately started the second Herat campaign, that is 1855 to 1856, uh, and uh, tried to benefit of the fact that the Russians are weakened and therefore would be able to give them greater concessions. As you might know, during the Turkmenchai uh, um, treaty, I mean, the Turkmenchai treaty, one of the items, one of the articles is that Iran has to pay 1 billion ruble, gold ruble, uh, to Russia um, as a war indemnity uh, that basically bankrupt the Raja government. I mean, one should bear that in mind. And the last payment, the last installment of that payment happened to be during the uh, 1850s and uh, the Crimean War. And Nasir Dinshaw uh, does a very, um, uh, hard bargaining with the Russians in order to basically that was that last installment was for, forgiven uh, to Iran 
in order to allow Iran to become an ally of the Russians vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the British, which act, as a matter of fact, as you might know, uh, uh, enraged the British and uh, in both campaigns that Iran fought uh, to, re, uh, to regain uh, Herat, which was in a sense part and parcel of Iran. In both these instances, uh, one in 1838-39 and one in 1855-56, in both instances, it outraged the British and then sent forces into the Persian Gulf, bombarded the, uh, uh, the port of Mahamara, sent troops through Boucher further north into Kazerun region, uh, and in effect forced Iranians to accept the British terms, which was the famous treaty of 1857 in Paris, that Iran basically gave um, uh, any kind of a, resigned from any territorial claims over uh, Herat. So uh, they, they played the game. They tried to benefit uh, from uh, Russia. The, the case that you brought out, also the case of the, Co uh, the Cossack forces, that's also another interesting point. Because in a sense, Nasruddin Shah seemed to have been giving, this was a gift uh, or rather a, a, an attempt on the side of the Russian Tsar uh, to encourage Iranians to create a Cossack force similar to the one that they had in the Russian Empire, but beyond anything for security reasons, because Nasruddin Shah was afraid that the same assassination attempt may happen to him as it happened to the Russian Tsar. Um, I think Alexander II. Um, so he uh, creates this uh, Cossack force, which rank and file are Iranians, but the officers uh, are all Russian officers. And in a sense, it becomes, you, you're absolutely right, it becomes some kind of a tool of the Russians for presence inside Iran, which by the way, British never had, but the Russians did. And uh, the way that these Cossack forces behaved, particularly after Nasruddin's assassination in 1896 and during the early days of the Constitutional Revolution is remarkably, uh, carrying through some of the policies of uh, uh, Russian Empire under Nicholas II. You can see that Lyakhov, and, uh, who was the chief officer of the Cossack force, the Cossack division, in, as you pointed out, uh, bombards the Majlis in, in uh, 1908 um, and uh, put an end to the constitutional period. Uh, and then, uh, uh, in effect, uh, declares a kind of a uh, declares a kind of a military government. That it's also remarkable to see that how the uh, fate of the two countries are interconnected. At the same time, we see that many of the revolutionary forces in the Caucasus also help the Iranian constitution of this Tabriz. You would find the Georgians, the Armenians coming actually and fighting in the Tabriz resistance between 1808 and, 1908 and 1909. Uh, so uh, it works in both way, si ways. And Iranians, uh, as you know, the conquest of Tehran in 1909 was a huge event in a sense that enraged the Russians, enraged the Imperial Russia because it saw that the combination of the revolutionaries that coming from this hotbed of Baku, Teflis into Iran and fighting on the side of the Iranians resulted in the loss of Muhammad Ali Shah and the, the, the abdication of uh, Muhammad Ali Shah and a victory for the constitutionalists. And they basically after 1907, which by itself is an important episode, uh, we see that Russians are in the North, really, from 1908 onwards, they are in the North all the way to 1917, the, the Bolshevik Revolution. And these 10 years, Iranians witnessed, particularly in the North, uh, 
the thrust of Russian aggression in a very, very uh, outrageous way by basically executing some leaders of the constitutionalists in Tabriz by by bombarding the Gohashad Mosque in, Ta- in Mashhad, uh, by basically dominating the whole of the northern Iran. And if it was not because of the 1917 uh, 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 Bolshevik revolution, probably one can argue as a kind of a counterfactual history, one can argue that northern Iranian provinces would have been entirely become annexed or part of the uh, uh, Russian empire in the north. The way that the Russians behaved during this period, this became very evident. So this was another miracle that may have, as Vadi pointed out, may have uh, played a part uh, in the uh, in the way that Iranians' uh, attitude towards Russia changed, because they with, they considered the 1917 revolution as a possible liberation of Iran from the two imperial powers that in 1907 basically divided Iran into two zones of influence. Fascinating. I, uh, um, I, I have obviously many more questions, but I will leave uh, time for our audience to ask questions. So I turn the floor to uh, Nargis to moderate uh, that, that portion. Sure. Um, we're having a lively discussion. Folks are asking a lot of questions in the um, chat. So we wanted to make sure to be able to post some of those to you, Professor Amonet. There's actually a question for, from Professor Yervand Abrahamian. Um, who asked that the Russian embassy in Tehran recently put up a memorial for Gribadov. I'm mispronouncing that, I'm sorry. What do you make of this? I can't imagine the Soviet embassy ever doing so. Well, Professor Abrahamian is the authority. So whatever I would say would be a footnote to what he had done about the relations between Iran and Russia and particularly uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, My answer to this is that Gribaydev is a very, uh, is a a, a rather uh, um, difficult individual to deal with because he has been, as you might know, a great poet and a playwright um, in, uh, with a certain, um, uh, a certain high position in Russian literature. And yet at the same time, he seemed to be a very typical example of it. Um, imperialist, orientalist kind of a um, a diplomat that was involved in the actual, uh, uh, the way that the um, Turkmenchai treaty was uh, put together. And then of course, as the first uh, minister uh, that was sent to Iran after the Turkmenchai, and he came to Iran, he behaved in a rather, uh, undiplomatic fashion as a conqueror and try to impose on Iran certain terms of the article of Turkmenchai, including uh, the return of some of the uh, uh, some of the slaves that were taken by the Iranians by the Qajar Iran earlier on in the uh, in the war with 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 Russia and claiming that these Armenian women are the subjects of the Ottoman Empire, subjects of the Russian Empire, I don't know why it's, I'll say Ottoman Empire, Russian Empire, and they have to be returned back home. Now, this has a great kind of a negative reflection on Iranians that resulted in the massacre uh, of the entire Russian mission, except for one, uh, 70 of them were uh, killed by the mob in Tehran in uh, 1829. So this was left as a kind of a memory. Now that the Russians, uh, I presume uh, Dr. Abrahamian's reference is to uh, the, the current uh, ambassador to uh, Tehran, who uh, basically uh, went to the old uh, Armenian cemetery in Tehran and paid homage uh, to Gribaydev was seen by the Iranians as this great offense, um, as this great um, act of uh, 
dishonor to Iran by bringing back the memory of Kribaidov. I think this is rather un unfair. I mean, after all, he was a great literary figure. And uh, after all, he was a victim of a mob attack. So I cannot see any reason why uh, his uh, paying homage to him should cause any uh, any uh, any makes make Iranians unhappy. Uh, uh, maybe Iranian nationalism still is very much uh, aware of the Turkmen Choi and uh, would consider this as a great trouble. He also seemed to have reenacted the presence of the uh, British, the Americans, and uh, in the, in the uh, compound of the British embassy, uh, some, uh, some rem remembrance of that moment in 1942, uh, uh, what, what, 1943. But whatever it is, I think this was more of a gesture to try to reintroduce um, uh, Russia, Russia as a great power that played an important part in Iran and is coming back to, in, in a sense, reassert its place in the Iranian politics. I don't know how satisfactory is this answer, but. Thank you so much. So um, uh, in the interest of time and because there are a lot of questions, if it's okay with you, Professor Amanat, I'm gonna pose two questions. One um, is from a uh, audience member who asks, um, who says, my question is the reverse of Dr. Nastya's first question, which is why, uh, is it that America has developed strong orbits of allies in the West, but Russia um, has been so weak in making cultural and political orbits of allegiances regionally? Um, and then there's a series of questions. I'm going to just sort of bring them all into one, which are asking about the current or the post-revolutionary period and asking why uh, Iran, or the United States has become, you know, in the narrative building of the post-revolutionary state, the great sa Satan, uh, whereas uh, that's not necessarily the narrative used against Russia. Um, and how strong, um, in your opinion, are pro-Russian forces among Iran's political elites, uh, given what's happening today and what's happened in the past 40 years. I don't know how much you want to take that question on, but I'll, I'll leave those two clusters. So the first one was about uh, the, U the US um, being able to create strong alliances in the West and Russia presumably not. And the second is about the contemporary period. Well, I think the second, the first question in part should be answered by the historians of the Cold War. It seems to me that the two spheres of Western, um, Western presence and the Soviet presence are fairly clearly divided between um, the two powers. And Russians recognize that there, there is a limit to the, way, to, the, to the extent that they can actually invade and occupy Eastern Europe, yes, this is their territory and remain their territory more or less, more or less up to 1991. Uh, the, in the Iranian side, again, uh, as a, I think a, a historical miracle that Iran managed to in effect, give a greater presence to, to, this, uh, to the United States vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. And uh, although it lost its position as a buffer state, but in the latter years of actually Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, we can see that there is an attempt to try to balance off, I mean, give Russians some room within Iran. It was not in this very kind of a, a raw and, uh, hostile relations that we would see in the 1960s. By the 1970s, the nature of the relations with the Soviet Union's changes. Uh, but in, uh, in, in effect, yes, the Soviets, uh, given that it had the limited resources compared to the United States, of course, uh, they try to concentrate on areas where they indeed had control and they had a presence and maintained that presence. 
and allow Iran to, to remain in the southern frontier as uh, a, a country that it's not going to uh, interfere with the domestic politics of the Soviet Union, but remain an ally of, 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 of the United States. And of course, the decline of the British uh, after 56 um, and uh, the fact that more and more the United States become the major power in the region tends to define a different, dictates different terms for the great power politics um, in the region. But the Iranian fears of the Soviets did not subside, it seems to me. Uh, even with the revolution of uh, 1979. Uh, although uh, it was for propaganda purposes, it was much easier to direct the uh, hostile attention and create a great uh, Satan in the form of the United States than in the form of the uh, Soviet Union. Uh, that was the posture that uh, the Islamic Republic basically inherited from, if I may say, from the left uh, in the 1960s and 70s, 1950s to 1960s and 70s. Even in an article, I have argued that the very concept of the great state and the way that it was pronounced by Ayatollah Khomeini is something that in the 1950s was uh, first broadcast uh, by uh, the Iranian, um, by the Persian program of the Mas Radio Moscow called Peke Iran, that referred to the United States as a great evil. And um, this may have been heard in Qom by people like Ayatollah Khomeini. So, because actually, as a matter of fact, the idea of the great state and the way that he portrays it does not seem to me have a particularly a strong Islamic background. So this seems to me coming more uh, from the politics of the 1950s. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's much easier to, to accuse and pause, uh, the, uh, pre present the United States, portray the United States as a great nemesis rather than, uh, rather than the Soviet Union, which at the time did not engage in any act of um, a, a hostility against Iran, although and one should also bear in mind that 1980, 1980, 81, when is the Afghanistan invasion has taken place. Uh, so Iranians had to be very worried about the Soviet Union. Um, uh, the fact that they were not, uh, maybe it's only because of the propaganda purposes that the United States served the Islamic Republic. As far as the second question, um, it may I ask you kindly to repeat if there is time for that. Sure, it's um, it's more about the the current moment. So it's about uh, Iran, the political structure in Iran, and those who are at the helm of it uh, since June, and their their positionality vis-a-vis -vis Russia, um, and how strong their that that political elite's relationship with Russia and the role that Russia plays in their understanding, um, especially given all of this other history that you've been talking about that's what um, you've I can make one very brief observation. Um, and that is that it seems to me that the entire region, that is what we may call the Eurasian world, is, uh, uh, is uh, witnessing a, a restructuring in a sense with the United States gradually, perhaps after uh, Afghanistan withdrawal uh, is gradually moving to the uh, to the background, and we see that the rise of two great powers, uh, this the Russian Russia and China, uh, creates a new environment altogether. And Iran would like to play a part in it. It seems to me, and for better or for worse, that is how it is. And therefore, uh, we see the reemergence of Russia as a great power in the new reconfiguration of the region. That's as far as I can go. Of course, this is more of an area of um, expertise to people like yourself and Vali and other people who have uh, a, 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 
paying attention to today's relations between the United States, between the uh, Russia and Iran. Thank you so much, Professor Amana. Unfortunately, we're at the hour because this conversation could go on for much longer. Um, yes. Audiences are asking a ton of questions and we've so enjoyed engaging with you. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. some of these issues that I've brought up uh, was, was in a sense with a great hurry. So I, the, each of these items could have been the subject of a, a one hour talk. So this is kind of a summary and I'm sorry that many issues were left un, unanswered. Well, for, well, for all of those who want to know a lot more about Iranian history, they should, they should definitely read your book. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, there is a huge amount of actually attention and inevitably ever since the 18th century to uh, Russian presence in Northern Iran. Thank you so much, Professor Amanat. Uh, before we let everyone go, please um, remember that we also have another event uh, tomorrow, same time, noon Eastern, on an, a book forum with Dr. Blake Atwood, um, who's just uh, will be talking about his book, Underground, The Secret Life of Video Cassettes in Iran, which focuses on the post-revolutionary period. But again, thank you so much to Dr. Amanat for this wonderful thank you, event. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.